Okay, so we see that this is a, a rational function, and we need to take the antiderivative of this rational function. So we could we could look for uh, undoing the chain rule if it's rigged just right, and this is essentially the derivative of that, but it's not at all. Okay, so then if it's a rational function like this, then we think about maybe partial fractions. Okay, are we ready to do partial fractions? What are we going to do first? All right, remember, so now your, um, your degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, so we start with long division. Okay, so let's do that here. I'm going to go kind of fast, and then you can stop me if I lose you, but... I don't want to spend a whole amount of time. So we got x cubed, or we got x squared, we want x cubed. So x is going to give us x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x. And then we're going to subtract. We're going to get minus 3x squared minus 2x and then drop the 6. And then we've got x squared, we want minus 3x squared. So minus 3. And we get minus 3x squared minus 9x minus 6. And now we're going to subtract, and we're going to get 7x plus 12. And nothing else to bring down, so we've got that this is the same as uh, x minus 3 plus... Make it two integrals. Uh, the remainder over the divisor. Okay. Did you follow? Any questions on that? So that's piece of cake. So we just need the second one. So the second one is perfectly. So it, we can do partial fractions if. That can be factored, right? We need we need at least the product of factors, and of course it can. X plus two, x plus one. <clears throat> and then hopefully this is a real easy one. So I'll start down here in blue, and we're going to have a over x plus two plus b over x plus one. And we need that to be equal to 7x plus 12 over x plus 2, x plus 1. <clears throat> okay, so don't just scribble furiously without thinking. Make sure you're tracking with me. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. This what now? Does what work sometimes change the constant? Yeah, everyone have a different problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you won't have this exact problem. That's so yeah, exactly. Other questions on what we've done so far? So now I'm gonna add these back together to and we need it to be equal to what we started with, right? So it's gonna be ax plus one. So we know multiply top and bottom by x plus one to get the common denominator. And then this one, top and bottom by x plus two. And then the, we'll get the common denominator, which we already have. So then this has to be equal to 7x plus 12. And so then our x term is going to be a plus b x plus a plus 2b equals 7x plus 12. So a plus b is 7, and a plus 2b is 12. Okay, so we could take the opposite of this top one and add, and then we get b equals 5. So a equals 2. And 
so what does that mean? So in the end, do it in red. In the end, we have to solve x minus 3 plus a, which is 2 over x plus 2. plus b, which is 5, over x plus 1. And that should be really, really easy. Any questions? So I won't go any further, because I think that's, hopefully that should be very easy from there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, that's not. That's not a it's, square root. Doesn't equate to doing the product rule. Right, but then there's you'd have to use another technique. But just because there's a square root in the integrand doesn't automatically mean you're going to undo the product rule. It could be undoing chain. It could be, yeah. So you would be doing this partial fraction? No, right. If there's this, right, this is partial fractions is for rational functions, which is one polynomial divided by another. If there's any radicals, then uh, you're not going to, anyway, you're not going to start with this. Yeah. Are we going to cover trig substitution on uh, radicals in the denominator? Uh, no, we're not going to do that. We can, we're just going to, um, for those, you can use the tables in the back of the book or else there's just too much material to get through before the exam. <clears throat> okay, other questions? Okay, so let's um, move ahead if there's no more questions. Okay. Okay, so maybe after class or office hours tomorrow? Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's Okay, so here's one. So what do we always ask first? What's the first thing, first line of defense? Okay, so so I recommend is it is it undoing the chain rule? Is it undoing the chain rule? And so what do we think? Is this undoing the chain rule? No. Could you come up with a change to this so that it would be? Okay, well, he said get rid of this term right here. If you got rid of this term right here, would it be undoing the chain rule? Yeah, because then this would be essentially the derivative of your denominator. What's another way to change it? Yeah, if you added 3e to the x in the numerator, then that numerator would essentially be the derivative of your denominator. Okay, good. So that would be two ways to do that. If you eliminated that or if you added it back up into the numerator. But we don't have either. So we kind of look at this here and, and we say, hmm, what does this look like? e to the 2x e to the 2x plus 3e to the x plus 2. So what does that kind of look like? Anyone recognize what that kind of looks like? This is, yeah, like this is like something squared, right? And then again squared, and then to the first power, and then a constant. So it's kind of like partial fractions in disguise, but we got all these e functions in here. And so... Um, this is a technique that we call using a change of variables, or substitution, substitution technique. So we're going to change this so it looks exactly like a, a partial fractions problem. So if we want this to be like just something squared, and then this something squared, and then this something to the x, what is that something? 
e to the x, right? e to the x, this is the same as e to the x squared. So if we say let u equal e to the x, then we're going to change the variables of this from x into u. So we'll have this all in terms of u, and there won't be any e's anymore. And then it'll be partial fractions, and we'll be home free. Okay? But that means we need to know what dx is. So if u is e to the x, then what is du? The derivative of u. e to the x, dx, like a mini chain rule there. So then what is dx? dx is du over e to the x. But we need all u's. So it's going to be du over what's e to the x? Well, that's u. So now we can rewrite this whole thing in terms of u. So e to the 2x, if u is e to the x, then e to the 2x is u squared. And there it is again. And then 3e to the x is 3u. So this is looking a lot friendlier now. And what was dx? du over u. Now, what kind of values were these, 3 and 8? Those are x values, right? Because we're dealing with so this. So it's not going to be this one's not going to be from three to eight. So we have two choices. We could switch that three and that eight into u, and then we never have to switch back to x because we're going to actually evaluate it and get the final answer as a value. Or we could do the antiderivative, switch it back to x, and then use three and eight. Either way. So let's do that second way. So we're going to just leave, leave, the, leave these off. There's, there's some values of u. And we can simplify this. We've got a u squared and a u. So it really becomes this, which is almost like the example I just did. OK, so it's going to be, this is going to be u plus 2, u plus 1. So it's going to be a over u plus 2 plus b over u plus 1. And that's going to equal this. So then we're going to do top and bottom by u plus 1. This is going to be a times u plus 1 plus b times u plus 2 equals just u, right? Just u. So your numerator is going to be this, and our numerator is u. So a plus b is going to equal 1, and a plus 2b is going to equal 0. OK, uh, so if I subtract here, I'm going to get do the subtract the top again. And so we'll get b equals negative 1, and a equals 2. Check my math. Did I do the math right? Cool. All right. And so then this is the same as 2 over u plus 2 plus negative 1 over u plus 1, which is easy. 2 natural log absolute value u plus 2 minus natural log absolute value u plus 1. And now, so the whole point of doing this change of variables substitution is to make the antiderivative friendly, which it was. And now we've got u equals e to the x. 
So now we can switch it back to into x. And then we can use our 3 and our 8. So it's going to be 2 natural log u equals e to the x plus 2 minus natural log e to the x plus 1. And then we're going to evaluate that from three, yeah, 3 to 8. What you can do. But you can only evaluate it from 3 to 8 when it's in terms of x, because 3 and 8 are x values. 3 and 8 are x values. So our other option would have been to change the 3 and 8 into u values. So when x is 3, what is u? e to the third. And when x is 8, u is e to the eighth. So then we could have just stuck with this one right here. And it would have, instead of being from 3 to 8, it would have been from e cubed to e to the eighth. So you could have evaluated this from e cubed to e to the eighth. And that would give the same results. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a, a non-definite integral, so if it's, uh, and uh, in, uh, what's that called? This is definite, so indefinite, yeah, indefinite. So if it's an indefinite integral, you have to change it back to x in the end, okay? So that, because you're getting the, the antiderivative just by itself, it needs to be in terms of x. So you have to work it through and then substitute back in from u back to x. Was there a question? Yeah? What's that? What, what's that? I don't understand the question. I was explaining a different way to do this. A different way is to, is to you can change the limits of x into their corresponding u values. And that you do from here. So when it's in terms of u, then when x equals 3, u equals e cubed. And when x equals 8, u equals e to the eighth. So this integral is equal to this one. So then you, if you were to evaluate this, you wouldn't have to change it back into x the way we did here. Does that answer it? Yep. Um, if you, after you changed it to u, uh -huh. if you ended up with a higher numerator than the denominator, would you have to uh, divide, or does doing the du? Right, do yeah, so now we're doing partial fractions. You're going to, yeah, long so division first, if this was equal to or greater than that. So that could happen even though you do the du. Uh-huh, yeah, cancel. depending on what the original problem is. Okay. So yeah, you want to follow the same partial fractions technique once you get here, and if that means long dividing first, you long divide first. Okay. Yep. Yeah? Uh, why did you choose u? Because um, uh, because this is essentially two quadratics, okay. and so then that gives me quadratics of u, which is the easy. It's just the easiest substitution I could make. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let's see a different one. So you you still have to plug in eight, plug in three, and subtract. I did not do that last step. Okay. Another example. Okay, so for this one, we're thinking, so first we ask, is it undoing the chain rule? No. No, not, not at all, okay? Not undoing the chain rule. Um, so 
Undoing the product rule, we got a fraction with a square root, looking pretty ugly. So we come to this, this other possibility of, is there a substitution we can do to make our life nicer? <coughs> What's that? <coughs> As how? Okay, we could write it as a product, and then in order to do what technique? What are you thinking? Yeah, so um, it's possible, but it's just, it, look, because it's something to the negative one half and then something squared, that kind of tells me that I'm, I would be a little leery of that. Because when I do antiderivatives and derivatives and then multiply them back together, I'm not seeing that getting getting easier. But that's you can try it. Just see what happens, yeah, if you want to try that. But... But from my experience, with one term squared and one to the negative one half, that's ugly. It's gonna. It's, I don't think it's gonna turn out to be a nice undoing the product, just from doing lots of these. So, but what I see here is that I could expand this out and get three terms, and then if this didn't have a sum down here, if this was just the square root of a single thing, then I could split it up into three fractions. Do you kind of see that? So therefore, I want to make u equal to what? x plus 1. Not x plus 1. Half. I want this whole thing to be u, right? u equals x plus 1 isn't. Um, if I put u equals x plus 1, this is not going to equal 1 half u, right? Because this 1 half is only multiplied with the x. Okay. So I want u to be 1 half x plus 1, that whole argument. Okay, now we need to find, uh, so a couple things here now. So we know that that whole thing will be u, but we got to find x for the numerator, and we got to find dx. Okay, so let's find x first. So if we solve this for x, we'll have u minus 1 uh, equals 1 half x. And so then x will be 2u minus 2. That's a good start. So now that can go in the numerator where there's an x. And then dx is going to be? 2 du. So du, or, yeah, so, that, so it's because I solved for x, then I can get exactly what dx is on the first, on the first try. If I know exactly now, I know that dx is 2 du. All right, so we're ready to substitute everything in. I'm just taking the derivative with respect to x here of this, which is just 2. Yeah. All right, so then we got, what's our x? 2x minus, 2u minus 2. And then minus 1 all over square root of, and then dx is times 2 du. So why is this helpful? It's helpful because now I can multiply out that numerator and then split it into three fractions. And I can just end up with a polynomial in the end, or uh, just three, three terms that will each be easy. So this is the same as 2u minus 3 here. So we can do 4u squared minus 12u plus 9 all over square root of u. And let's just pull the 2 out here like this. OK, I'm sure I'll stop there. I'll slow down there and just make sure you got it. <clears throat> Following everything I did? Yeah? Yeah, I just took that 2 and put it in front of the integral. Yep, it's this one right here. Okay, and so then we're going to separate. Yeah, so whenever you have a fraction... Not whenever, but always look out for splitting up. If you've got some or difference of terms in the numerator, the possibility of splitting it up into multiple fractions. Okay, so we just had that single term. That's what we want to do here. So we'll have four. What would that be? U to the three halves will be the first one, right? Because that's going to be two minus a half, and then U minus a half is going to be U to the one half. 
and then plus 9u to the minus 1 half. And then we got an easy one. We just got to get our power rule right. <coughs> Questions on that? See what I did? Yeah, I just split this up into three fractions which is essentially, you can think of this as division, each one divided by square root of u, or each one times u to the minus 1 half, whatever, however you want. Good? All right, so that's going to be 2 times 4 times, what, 5 halves, 2 fifths, u to the 5 halves, minus 12 times 2 thirds u to the 3 halves, So this is just get your arithmetic right. 9 times 2, u to the 1 half. So I just raise power. Just do, all I have to do is the power rule. You know, like we, we die for ones like these right now, right? These are easy. OK, and so then. Uh, but then we have to back substitute, right? So we, the answer is, needs to be in terms of x. And so we go back to our, what did we say u was? 1 half x plus 1. So I'm going to multiply the 2 in, and I'm going to substitute back the 1 half x plus 1 in for u. So this is going to be 2 for 8 fifths, no, 16 fifths, 1 half x plus 1 to the 5 halves. Minus, so 2, minus 48 thirds. Uh, 1 half x plus 1 to the 3 halves. Plus 36, 1 half x plus 1 to the 1 half. Plus C. So now we're back in terms of x and we got it. Unless I made a mistake. Agree with my math? Question, time for questions. Follow all the math? Did I do it right? OK, so you guys try one while I take attendance. Can I erase this? Going, going, gone. So here's the one you're going to do. Okay, go work together. Oh. It won't change your letter grade. It'll change your grade a little bit, but it'll change your letter grade. <laughs> okay, how do we start? What should we make you? X minus 2, and so then we need X and we need DX. So X is U plus 2, and DX is just DU, 1 DU. So I can give you a nice easy one here. So x is u plus 2. There's your x. Cube root of u. That's what we wanted. And then du. 
Why did that help us? Because we can distribute and just do two terms. So u times cube root of u is u to the? Okay, so another technique you have to be on the lookout for. So what's this, uh, 3 sevenths, 7 thirds? Uh, four th 3 fourths, 4 thirds? And then we have to switch back to x. So, when u, so now what is u is x minus 2. Six fourths three halves. Questions? So we kind of saw two uses of this substitution technique. The first was to make it look like something that we know, like um, we had all the e to the x's, and by getting rid of the e to the x's, it became a partial fractions problem. This is a, these last two problems we've done are another kind of useful thing for the substitution is that if you can get what, what's under the radical as just one thing, then you can distribute that, right? You can, you can multiply that through and just get a bunch of separate terms. So that's two things to be on the lookout for in terms of substitution. Okay, another thing to use substitution for is to get ready to use it for in the tables. So in the back of your book, even if you don't have your book, that's okay. But in the back of your book, there is a there's pages of tables. They're called tables of integrals, and they're numbered, okay, one through 120. Okay, so there's 120 different forms, and so basically, when you're given an integral, it you have to find if it's a, if you're going to use the table, you have to find the form that matches or the form in the table that matches the one you're given, and you might have to do a, a use substitution to get it to be exactly like what's in the book, and then you can apply the table. Okay, so let's do an example of that. And, and you'll also find that the table would be a means of checking some of these other techniques that we're learning. So you're responsible for the techniques, but then some of these problems that we've done already would just be a, a matter of applying a table integral. So you could use that to check if you wanted to check. So here's an example. So uh, tables. My eyesight is going in my old age. Two to three. One over. Okay, so you see the radical and you think, oh, what about u equals that whole thing? Maybe, but with these squares, it, it could get ugly, okay? So, and there's nothing wrong with trying. If you have an idea, there's nothing wrong with trying it, okay? But uh, because this is a little more, you've got these squares here, um, that's not going to do it. So what we're looking for, there's, there's a whole, in the tables, there's a whole section Where it says this, it says forms involving. If you have your book, you can go look in the back there. Forms involving u squared plus a squared. That's a u. And then u squared minus a squared. A squared minus u squared. Is there another one that's kind of like that? A plus BU is the next section. So 
each one of these is a whole section of the table. So there's a whole bunch of forms involving that one, a whole bunch of forms involving that, this, and that. So which one of these four, A, B, C, or D, would match up with the one we have? A, B, C, or D. So A is a constant. A is a constant, and U is our variable. They're saying B. U is our variable. And they are correct. Because we have something something with our variable squared minus a constant. Okay? So now we need to change this. We need to we need to make it look exactly like this. We need to make it look exactly like u squared minus a squared. And actually now in the table then, the one that matches, if you look in the list, exactly which one matches this form. So we're looking at so Numbers 39 through 46 are these forms that you chose, B, 39 through 46. So which one of those matches exactly with what we have? We need it to be in the denominator, the u squared minus a squared to be in the denominator, and then another something squared in the denominator, 45. So number 45 looks like this. Table entry number 45 is this. du over u squared times square root of u squared minus a squared equals, and then they give you the answer. And the answer is square root of u squared minus a squared over a squared u plus c. So this is what's in the table that we're going to use to solve the one we were given because it matches the form. We've got 1 over something squared, square root of something squared minus 7. That matches this, and that's table entry number 45. <coughs> so now we've got to get ours to look like that. Okay. So what are we going to call u? So we need this to be u squared, therefore u has to be what? 4x. Not 4x. So what squared gives us 4x squared? 2x. I'll do this in red. So u is going to be 2x. And what is a going to be? The square root of 7. Because 7 has to be a squared. So a is going to be square root of 7. Do you follow how we got that? We're, so we're trying. We're making ours look exactly like this. That means that something squared. That's our four x squared. But u has to be two x because then u squared is the four x squared. Okay, but now what is x squared? So we just have an x squared here. <coughs> so what is x squared then? It's going to be u over two. So x is u over two. So then x squared is going to be u over 2 quantity squared. And what is dx? dx is 1 half du. So half derivative of u, 1 half u is... <coughs> So all this stuff is what we're using to change ours into one that looks like table entry number 45. So here we go. Okay, so we'll leave these off. So it'll be 1 over x squared is u over 2 quantity squared, or I'm going to put u squared over 4. Is that okay? It's the same as that. Times the square root of? D, I'm doing dx on this, right? dx is going to be 1 half, oh, just du, is that what you're saying? Yeah, sorry. Just 1 half du, not u. Thank you. It's just a half du. Okay, and so then this, this is u squared. That's what we wanted. And then minus a squared.
And then dx is 1 half du. What's that? Yeah. So the only thing different now is just this constant, right? So we have a, we're going to have a, this will be 4 in the numerator and 2 in the denominator. So then this becomes, so this 4 and this 2 just make for a 2. And now we have exactly what the table says. And we're ready to, now we just apply the table. So what is this? It's this, right? So we have 2 times square root of u squared minus a squared over a squared u. But we need that back in terms of x now. Back in terms of x, it's going to be 2 times square root of 4x squared minus 7 over a squared is 7 times 2x. Now that it's back in x, so we, now that it's back in x, we're going to evaluate that from 2 to 3. And we can, before we do that, 2 over 2 is gone. Question? How do you get from 1 half to u to taking that 1 half to u to um, So this was 4. I combine this 4, which is really just a 4 in the numerator. This is, if you're dividing by the fourth, that's multiplying by 4. And then you're dividing by 2, so 4 divided by 2 is 2. Yep. What else? It's just 7x in the denominator. Yep, just 7x in the denominator. And then we plug in, you're going to plug in 3, plug in 2, and subtract. Yeah, yeah. So if it's if, if on the test you're using the table technique, you'd have to have this or, or a bunch of these, and you have to pick the right one. Yeah, exactly. And then someone asked about trig substitution. Well, this is this is essentially a trig substitution problem. So we'll, we'll, for our purposes, we'll just use the table to do those those problems. So for the actual question on test, you'd say use one of these. <clears throat> no, you just you might have a several several integrals to solve, and then I'll give you a table, and then you'd have to decide which ones you'd use the table on, right? Okay? <laughs> and which ones you use trig substitute or uh, uh, which one you use partial fractions, and which ones you undo the chain rule. So that's the added so in your studying. That's the added dimension to this is now you have to also be able to not just do the techniques, but identify which technique, okay? And that's where that list comes in because the lists are all jumbled together. So you get to practice. So from experience, you just know that's going to be nasty if you try to do the product. Yeah, to the negative 2 and to the negative 1 half. So you're going to have 1 to the negative 2 and 1 to the negative 1 half, and then a 4x squared minus 7 in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's you start doing your like that. Right. So if, it's, if you can try it, if it blows up on you, then you're like, OK, maybe this is a different technique. You know? okay. Yeah. Uh, can you explain how you get the a to the squared 7? Because that needs to be a squared. So in the, in the form, it's u squared minus a squared. So a squared equals 7. And then so the area is radical 7. What else? OK, so another common one for the, uh, for the tables is like cosecant cubed or secant cubed. Is a real common one. So, <clears throat> so if you look in, there's a whole section on forms of well, trigonometric forms. So you look at the list of trigonometric forms. You just basically have cosecant cubes. So you come down here and you look. Oh. Number 72, cosecant cubed. Sorry.
which says that cosecant cubed u du equals negative one half cosecant u cotangent u plus one half natural log cosecant u minus cotangent u what do you mean wow they're giving you the answer It sounded like people were sighing, like, oh, that's so awful. No, that's the answer. Okay? So, but the only difference is we've got, we don't have cosine cubed of u, we have something over 2. So, therefore, we're going to use substitution of x over 2. The only thing else we need is dx. So, uh, x is 2u. dx is going to be 2 du. And we're off to the races. So it's going to be cosecant cubed u times dx, 2 du. So our answer is basically going to be 2 times this. But then with x over 2 plugged back in, where there's a u. You see that? So the, so the only difference between ours and the table is it's a, a factor of 2. So our answer is going to be 2 times this whole thing. So you can just take away the one-halves, but then you have to substitute x over 2 back in for u. So x over 2, x over 2, x over 2, x over 2. That's all there is to it for an easy one. It doesn't matter if it's inside or outside. Everything is going to be times 2. And then our u is x over 2. So I'll just do it. Negative cosecant. <coughs> Probably. That one? This is what I. This is exactly what I just wrote this down from the table. This came right from the table. That's table line seventy-two. When I did the substitution, I end up getting just all I get was two times that. So I'm going to do two times that, and then wherever there's a u, I'm going to do x over two. Okay. So I just want to introduce. The next part, which we'll finish on Wednesday. Any questions about? So we see these u substitutions are good for, um, like if, if it kind of looks like partial fractions in disguise or something like with a bunch of e to the x's, and you can get rid of those e to the x's by plugging in u. That also works with some trig problems. And then we saw it where it was u was nice to put it as the whole argument in the radical. And then that becomes a single term that we can multiply through to others. And then the u substitution we use for these table techniques. <coughs> um, for the natural log, so your answer is plus, and then log is a minus. Would you distribute? Oh, no, it's minus. Is he the only one who knows that? So it doesn't work if you don't follow the rule. Thank you. Okay. Questions on this? All right, so now we want to deal with something called improper integrals. Can I erase? So in order to start talking about this, see if we remember what we learned in the first week. But no, someone say no. 
Then we need to review it fast. It's a big chunk of the test. What's the meaning of, let's see. What is the, can you express, articulate the meaning of that? Get a partner, practice, go. What is the meaning of that whole expression? What does it mean? Okay, volunteer. So, what does this thing mean? Yes, sir? Uh, that means the total amount of change of some quantity x, um, that changes at a rate of 1 divided by x squared over an infinite amount of infinitesimal intervals in a constant space is giving you this Okay, awesome. Just one thing. You said that the quantity was, at, you said that the total change of a quantity x. So that, that's, that was your only little mistake. The, the quantity is not x. It's just some quantity function. x is the independent variable of a quantity function. So it's not the total change of x. Do you see? OK, yeah. So, but, but everything else was brilliant, OK? So it's the total change of some quantity whose rate of change is 1 over x squared as x changes from 2 to 10. So what is, let's just uh, look at that. What, Let's look at the rate function. y equals 1 over x squared. And we just want it from starting at 2. Zoom in a little bit there. OK, so. So we're going to look at, this is our rate, this is the rate function. This is 1 over x squared. <laughs> so based on, if at this rate of change, so what happens to the quantity as x goes from 2 to 10? What's, what, what's the quantity doing as x goes from 2 to 10? Decreasing, decreasing right? Is the quantity decreasing or increasing? Increasing. Increasing, why? <laughs> The rate is positive. The rate is decreasing, but the rate is always positive. So for this whole interval from 2 to 10, you're going to see that quantity increase. It's just going to increase at a slower pace as, as, you, as x increases. Is it positive? But, oh, sorry. Good. Is it positive because it's above the x-axis? The rate of change is positive, which is, which is shown by the fact that it's above the x-axis. That's right. So because the rate of change is positive, from 2 to 10, that quantity is going to increase the whole way. Okay, so then what would, there we go. So then what would this mean? So still the, the amount of change of some quantity with that rate of change function 1, x, 1 over x squared as x goes from 2 on forever. So what's the quantity going to do? What's the quantity going to do starting at 2 as x increases? It's just going to keep increasing and increasing. So shouldn't this, if, that, if the quantity keeps increasing and increasing, Shouldn't this just be an infinite amount of the quantity? So if if it's if you have a quantity that's always increasing and you keep going as to to infinity, uh, it won't stop increasing, but it will continue to increase at a smaller and smaller rate. Okay. So let's see what happens if we kind of try to solve this. So in order to do that, you can't plug infinity into things, but we can take limits, right? 
So we're going to take the limit as A gets very large. And then we'll use, instead of, we'll have a limit of integration that we can actually plug in A. But then we'll, at the end, we'll let A get very large. Okay? So this equals. Nice and easy, x to the negative 1, but then it's negative, right? From 2 to a. So plug in a, this is going to be negative 1 over a plus 1 over 2. What happens to that as a gets really, really big? It's going to go, that's going to get really small. It's going to essentially be zero when A gets really, really big. Therefore, so this is kind of interesting. We have a, a rate that's positive forever. So we have a quantity, an, a quantity that's increasing forever, yet the, the amount of that quantity is one half. Not only, so not only is this not infinity, but this is kind of a small number, one half. Okay, so what's going on? Why? How is it possible that that, that quantity is increasing forever with a positive rate, but then we get a finite amount of that quantity? So how is that possible? Yeah. Because it will just be increasing so infinitely small. Okay. Now. And how do we how do we see that? Where do we see that here? Uh, that it continues to approach zero. Yeah. Someone else had their hand up. Yeah. Same thing. Exactly. So. The fact that the rate is getting so, so close to zero that the amount of increase, after a while, the amount of increase on that quantity is just neg negligible. It is increasing, but just by such a small amount that it never eclipses a total quantity of one half. Okay, so it's increasing forever, yet it increases, it's, yet it reaches a finite amount. Okay, pretty cool. So let's just do one more fast here. So how about this? And we'll do this one from, sorry. All right, how about this, 6 over x? So we'll do the same thing again. Okay, antiderivative of 6 over x. 6, better know this. Natural log. Absolute value of x, but that doesn't make, that doesn't matter in this case. Oh, I made it 4, right? 4, sorry. Because x is always positive already. So what do we get? The limit as a gets really, really big. 6 natural log of a. I'll just take off the absolute values because that's going to be positive. Minus 6 natural log of 4. As a gets really, really big, what does that do? So now, if a gets really, really big, what does natural log look like? It goes up. It goes up, and it keeps going up, and up, and up, and up. So this one that I did, is called divergent. Why? Because in this particular case, the amount of the quantity does increase indefinitely. Because this integral, as a, a gets really, really big, that amount of that quantity, the change in the quantity, gets really, really big. We just saw it right there. So that's divergent. But 6 over x gets close to 0 as the rate function. So why is this different? Okay. 
So if I question. Because when I the last time when we we took the the limit we got one half. Okay. Now when we take the limit we get it just gets infinitely big. This gets infinitely big as a gets infinitely big. Natural log doesn't go down, it goes up. Okay, so the the idea here is that although both rate functions, sorry. Although both rate functions, six over or one over x squared and six over x, they both get approach zero. What's the difference? How does this one go to zero compared to the other one? A lot slower. It's see how much much higher it is, and it'll, it'll eventually get very small, but not soon enough for the amount of the quantity to just just get really really large. So. So not only does the rate function have to go to zero in order for the quantity to be a finite amount, but it has to get to, to zero fast enough. Six over x doesn't. Six over x hovers up higher, so that total amount of that quantity just gets infinitely big. And we'll continue that on Wednesday. So web work and start studying for your exam.